Every so often in the comments section of this series, I will get a suggestion from one or two of you guys of a car that could be featured. It could be a supercar, race car, classic, concept, and more often than not, it's one which I may have already had down on the list. Sometimes it's just maybe not obscure enough or crazy enough or intriguing enough to justify an episode. And then occasionally, and we have had some in the past already that did fall under this category, it is a car. That is definitely worthy of being featured and this is one of those occasions because a few weeks back and a few episodes back this car was suggested to me to include in the series and as soon as i looked into it i agreed it does deserve a place because it's not just a car that's old or rare or maybe even fast or just oddball for the sake of it it actually had a very specific purpose multiple purposes in fact and a very intriguing story behind it now the car in question is as you saw from the title called the dimaxion car and the first thing that jumps out at you is the look of course it's a crazy looking machine it looks kind of like an aerodynamic minivan with a front overhang which would worry any driver on a mountain mountain road and a very aerodynamic looking shape for what is very obviously a vintage car or at the very least a classic when's this car from the 50s the 60s the 1900s who could really say well actually you can say obviously because it was released and built in the early 30s it was shown in the early 30s around 33 and 34 at the world's fair and it was a car that very interestingly was never intended for mass production so why then was it shown well, actually, and I can fully appreciate this kind of thinking, it was shown as one man's vision more so of the future in general, rather than trying to sell his specific idea to the masses. And in a funny kind of way, that actually reminds me of the vehicles that are vaguely featured in the Fallout game franchise, like Fallout 4 in particular. There are nuclear-powered classic cars in that game, which of course never actually existed, but it was the game developer's vision of what an alternate future could have looked like. That's kind of like what the Dimaxian car is, but in the real world. Now the brains behind the car, the vision in effect, was from a certain Bucky Fuller who you've probably heard of before. Now, he was aided in building the car, of course, by a number of people. As far as the design goes, he was aided by two other people in particular. One is a Navy engineer by the name of Starling Burgess, and the other is a sculptor by the name of Isamu Noguchi. And Mr. Noguchi in particular had a big hand in developing the model of the car for wind tunnel testing, because one of the main things about the Dimaxian car was that it needed to be aerodynamically efficient, but not just for the sake of performance and fuel economy, which he did have in mind, but also because of the car's future potential. Because this was intended to be one of the earliest examples of what a flying car could have looked like. Now, of course, not in this form. It doesn't have any wings, it can't fly under its own power, but it was intended by Bucky Fuller in particular to be kind of a stopping off point between the two, a vehicle that could be later on refined and developed into something which could drive along the road, but then under its own power, leave the road, fly around and land again, but with more of a jump jet style rather than a leaving on a runway kind of vibe. And it's safe to assume that that thinking was very far ahead of its time. In fact, it was a couple of decades ahead of its time as far as jet propulsion went. Now, of course, the car didn't get that far, and it's kind of a good thing that it didn't, because given its construction with aluminium body, wooden frame, the nature of the car's handling with three wheels, rear engine, front wheel drive layout, and rear steering through one wheel alone, which in hindsight doesn't sound like the best possible layout when it comes to stability, the car had a number of incidents. Now, three prototypes were produced. As I said, they were shown at the World's Fair in the early 30s on a couple of occasions. On one occasion, though, they crashed into another car around a 70 mile per hour collision, which killed the driver. It was a race driver who was test driving the car, driving up to the event. And of all people, he crashed into the, I think it was the French air minister and a spy or something like that in another vehicle kind of a, a weird occasion a weird accident and it took a while for that to get cleared up and for them to decide that it wasn't the Dimaxian at fault it was 
basically a regular crash that went wrong. The car actually rolled, and because of its structural integrity, or lack thereof, it killed the driver, and the other passenger was thrown from the vehicle. Now, later on, Bucky Fuller himself crashed the second prototype with his daughter in the car as well. Thankfully, they both managed to survive that, but it's a car which is inherently flawed, let's just say. It has some potentially really cool features, like the fact that, as I said, it's one of the very few rear-engine front-wheel drive cars, an RF layout, and it also has the ability to turn up to 90 degrees with that rear wheel, which gives it an incredible turning circle, which you would kind of need given the 20-foot length of the car. But, and this isn't surprising for its time, for everything that it did well, it did another thing not so well. And that's completely forgivable, because this is the early 1930s after all, and people were experimenting all over the place with aerodynamic cars. They'd already been experimenting with that in the 20s and the 10s even. Of course, the Grand Prix cars of the time are much better known than cars like this. Stuff like the Audi Streamliners, the Mercedes Streamliners, the so-called Silver Arrows. They're well known, but cars like this not so much. Now, the reasons why Bucky Fuller didn't want the car to enter production are fairly obvious. I think he knew before they even started testing it that it probably wouldn't be an ideal passenger car. He wanted it to be a car that would inspire people's minds rather than their wallets. And of course, that is often the case with a smart man behind a car. He might not be the best businessman, but he's got great ideas. It tends to be somebody else who will come along and turn it into a profitable business. But in the case of this one, due to its own limitations, of course that didn't happen. Now, as far as the three prototypes that were produced, which incidentally were powered by Ford flathead V8 engines, they themselves have an interesting production history, but not necessarily in a bad way, thankfully, because the car doesn't exactly need any more bad intrigue in its past. It had plenty of that after they were built. But the car was actually built, or all three prototypes were built in Connecticut and only 27 employees were used to build them. But over 1,000 people applied for those 27 jobs. So people were clearly inspired, and at the end of the day, that's what Bucky Fuller wanted. Now, of course, they weren't necessarily inspired to buy one, they just wanted to have a hand in building potentially what would become the future. And although ultimately most of the things on the car, the majority of things, in fact, did not end up being the norm, we don't exactly have a lot of rear engine, front wheel drive, three wheeler, rear wheel steer, aggressively upward jutting vehicles like this around. So for the most part, it was left to history, which is part of the reason why it's obscure. But still, a car doesn't necessarily need to succeed for it to be very, very cool. Just trying something so radically different makes it worthy of talking about in my book. And the fact that it worked as well as it did is remarkable as well. And as far as performance goes, they did actually invite it to a track to see how quick it could go. And although I wasn't able to find out what that speed was, I'm sure you could probably find it if you dug deep enough on the internet, it did beat the previous record by half again. So not bad at all. Now, don't expect it to be some 200 mile per hour machine. Of course not. I wouldn't even want to try and attempt that with rear wheel steering. But at the same time, the performance could quite easily be there because the car is so aerodynamic, you wouldn't need a massive amount of power. And in case you were wondering, the name itself, Dymaxion, actually is a combination of three words put together. It's the DY from dynamic, the MAX from maximum, and ION from tension. So dynamic maximum tension, the Dymaxion car. And that was kind of a, a, a hot button word, you could say, for Bucky Fuller. He liked the term, and as I said, he used it on more than just this car. But this one is probably one of the most notable examples of using that name. Now, a couple of recreations which it's difficult to say how faithful they were, given that each of them looks slightly different, and the interior, in particular, of the original car was not particularly well documented, as far as resto mods go and recreations go, but they do exist. Recreations of the car were built in more recent years, and those are the majority of the photos that you can see. So overall, it was a car which had amazing vision for the future. For its time, it was amazingly creative. Turned out that it wasn't exactly a harbinger of things to come, because, as I said, most of those things didn't come to cars later, 
but at the very least it's an imaginative car, it dared to be different, and even though it was ultimately kind of a failure, there's something inherently charming about the car, for sure, and I think it would be an awesome car to have in some kind of racing game like Gran Turismo or Forza. You'd probably flip the thing over on every turn, but still, it would be very cool to experience something so different. But that's it for this pick overall. Of course, if you are new to Unsung Heroes, you can see all of the previous episodes by clicking through here at the end. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.